So yeah, today we're going to try to finish up most of the mathematical preliminaries for the class. This class, we're going to talk about this digitization step where the radiation now is reached by a detector. And that will allow us to describe the sampling theorem and then talk about discrete math. Because after the sampling theorem is applied to our continuous uh, radiation field that we want to measure, then we can digitize it and understand uh, the digital signal and how that's going to pass through our machine learning analysis. In the last class, we spoke about a lot of the conditions required to model how radiation changes, I would say abstractly, uh, via black box transformations. And so you can model any development of radiation under a number of assumptions as a convolution, right? When you apply convolutions, you should immediately be thinking that's like a Fourier transform. The, two, the Fourier transforms we're going to be doing in this class are two-dimensional. So that's probably new to a lot of you. And it's not that different than the one-dimensional ones. It's just one extra dimension, but it then becomes like a visual picture. And so light actually really, or radiation in general, actually undergoes these Fourier transforms on its own due to physical diffraction, which we'll talk about later in the class. And so you can take any image you want. You can take your own selfie and then take its 2D Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform. So for the images here, again, where the values of the function are the intensities of each pixel. And we went ahead and computed those Fourier transforms. And remember, Fourier transforms are deal with complex signals. And so even though you're starting with a real non-negative two-dimensional signal, you're going to end up most likely with a complex valued Fourier transform. And so there's going to be an amplitude and associated phase with that. Right. And so the phase is actually more important. People can show, like if you delete the amplitude and just keep the phase and do an inverse Fourier transform, you'll get the original image which, with much higher fidelity than uh, if you just keep the amplitude. So just get comfortable with uh, in NumPy or in your Python code, the idea that you will have these complex values laying around in your homework and don't ignore them. I don't just take the real part, which I think a lot of some students have done in the past. The real and imaginary part are both useful and really what's a better visualization is the absolute value, right? Which is the magnitude, mp.abs, and the phase, which is the angle, mp.angle. Then there's the convolution theorem. It's always hard for me to verbally state this because it's a little like one extra degree of complexity beyond like what a normal person can say in a sentence. But I wrote it down below. So the convolution of two functions in space, uh, which is what's in the bracket there, can be performed by a multiplication in the Fourier domain. And so what you're multiplying in the Fourier domain is the Fourier transform of each of those functions. And then you need to use a Fourier transform to go back and forth between the two, right? And so we went through this quick exercise. If you want to convolve two functions, U1 and U2, you can go ahead and do so by doing the convolutions we've spoke about, spoken about in the class. You can also take the Fourier transforms and multiply them. And this is an element-wise multiplication, right? So just functional multiplication. The effect of the convolution is summarized by the idea that any convolution, you know, with a finite width will be represented in the Fourier domain by some function with a finite width that approaches zero at, at the edges. And so those zeros will naturally reduce or remove, eliminate if they are zero, the, the values in the original uh, function you started with. And so that's called a low-pass filter or band-limiting operation. And so you're going to remove higher frequencies from your Fourier transformed uh, signal. And the result of that le leads to a lower resolution or less information-rich signal than what you started with. Just as a refresher, we, we went through this, this picture. So we had a signal and it's Fourier transform. And we spoke about convolving it with a, a convolution filter, right? And so we showed that when we involved with a convolution filter, these details washed out, these higher resolution, higher frequency values, rather than this chirp function, which starts from lower frequency and goes to higher frequency. And so what I want you to think about just for a minute, you can kind of conceptually try to fill in these blanks, is now we've made this blur function wider, the convolution filter. And so what's going to happen to the picture over here in the upper right? What's going to happen to the function here in the middle bottom? And then the result of the product of this and that middle function, what's that going to look like? 
Fourier transform of H is definitely going to be narrower. What's the effect of that narrowing Fourier transform? Less high frequency signals are passed. So you have more of a band limiting operation. So this is going to get narrower, and then that's going to cut off more of these higher frequencies. And so the picture is going to be even more blurry. You're going to have even less of those high frequency wiggles in your signal. Right. So that's a useful kind of intuition to just try to keep, especially in imaging, where that this effect happens all the time. These trade-offs, right? this kind of oscillation between what happens in, in the real spatial domain and then what a picture of that is in the Fourier domain. Okay, cool. So we're on to digitization. So the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go through the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, and then we'll go on to cover the rest of the math in the discrete space that we'll deal with. And it's really useful to Google and read about this, I would say. It's incredibly important. It's probably the most important mathematical connection, one of the most important mathematical connections, I think, that allow us to apply regular continuous math ideas in to computers, basically. And so it, it, it's important, not just like kind of from the theoretical aspect, but also practically. So the results of this sampling theorem can really inform how you should make sure anything you digitize actually is done so correctly. So it really um, boils down to kind of a picture shown here for imaging. We have a continuous function down here. This gray thing has some values and it represents our radiation field. So whatever's coming in, which we've described as this cosine type function with the amplitudes that vary across space. So this is a complex function, right? U of R or U of X comma Y generally we'll write. And it just has any arbitrary values, but at any point, right? It's continuous. It's not, okay, until you get to the quantum level, then there becomes these discrete things you have to worry about. Generally speaking, before you reach the quantum level, anywhere across space, you can sample that field and it'll have some some value, some intensity, right? Then it's gonna hit our detector and we're gonna represent our detector as in this picture, it's, it's these little arrows. So each arrow represents some sort of digitization element. That in your phone is a pixel. These are light sensitive areas that are formed in semiconductor material, right? So silicon, right, is photosensitive in the visible range. When light hits it, it'll excite electrons. Those electrons can then be pulled off if a voltage is applied to form a current that you can measure, right? And you want to do that at discrete locations, little individual locations. Each of those locations is represented by an arrow. There's other forms of detection elements. There's PMT, stand for photo multiplier tubes. Those are used in microscopes a lot. SPADs are called single photon avalanche diodes. Those are now in the newer, newest iPhone and the AR glasses. Those are like whatever fancy CMOS, they are made in CMOS, but they have a different structure and they can detect single photons. There's antennas, right? You can imagine having for microwave experiments in uh, ultrasound, these can be transducers, little transducers, either 1D or 2D arrays of those, right? So it's pretty much universal. If you wanna capture images and have them be digitized, you need something that samples the signal unless you're really old school and you use film and then you like look at the film, which some clinicians I think still do, but fewer and fewer and fewer. Okay. So really it's any image that we will see in the future that's not hitting our retina will have gone through this process pretty much. I can almost guarantee that. So we need to understand, well, how does this continuous function, which has infinite values, right? Anywhere you sample it, it has a value. How can we represent it as a finite set of numbers, right? Of measurements. So the sampling theorem says that under certain conditions, you can do that. You can measure some function with an infinite number of values. As long as it satisfies certain conditions, you can then have a set of numbers that just represent it, a finite set of numbers that you can like save in memory and manipulate, right? It's kind of this weird infinite to finite bridge. Okay, so to understand this, we're going to first define our sampled signal, and it's equal to the product in this derivation of our continuous field u, which is a two-dimensional continuous complex function, and a comb function. So comb functions are just a series of delta functions that are evenly spaced. Those are the arrows. Each of those delta functions samples our signal. 
Right? In reality, like a pixel isn't a perfect delta function, right? It's not just sampling at one tiny little location. It has a finite area that's easily included in this analysis with some extra math that just makes everything a little more complicated. So we're not going to consider the finite width of our uh, pixels in this analysis. Okay, so to do this quick derivation of where the sampling theorem lands us, we're going to take the Fourier transform of this function, either side of it. So when you take the Fourier transform of the product of two functions, right, it's equal to the convolution of those two functions, their Fourier pairs, right? Again, applying the convolution theorem that we just showed on two slides ago. I can write this equation below. The sample function represented in the Fourier domain, the spatial frequency domain, is equal to the Fourier transform of our home involved with the Fourier transform of this gray function of interest. So what's the Fourier transform of a comb function? Well, luckily, it kind of is like a Gaussian. It's another comb. It's just at a different periodicity. So the Fourier transform of our comb function is going to be, again, a, just a series of delta functions. Here it goes on for infinity. That's just a mathematical kind of nicety that, of course, doesn't in practice. There's no infinitely sized digital detectors. And so this product, the convolution of our Fourier transform comb and our signal in the Fourier domain can be rewritten as a sum of shifted versions of our original signal in the Fourier domain. Right? In other words, you can rewrite this expression you know, with the idea that this comb where you're transformed in just a series of delta functions as this expression down here. It maybe is easier to see that graphically. And so what we've done is if this represents our original signal in the Fourier domain, this represents its sampled version here. It's a repeated series of that function that have been shifted to higher frequencies. So that's really the effect of sampling. When you have some continuous function and you sample it at very discrete intervals with delta functions, right, measuring it, so to speak, in the Fourier domain, what you're doing is you're taking that original function and creating copies of it. Right? And then the copies are shifted. And so here I've drawn the copies shifted so that they're not overlapping. That is not always true. That's been done, you know, to make the picture clear and will lead to a condition that is needed to satisfy or make this sampling theorem work well. Just, just keep that in the back of your head. And the other thing that's included in this drawing is the fact that this function here in the Fourier domain goes to zero, right? It doesn't keep going and have all these values, right? Because then if it keeps going and has all these values further out, it'll be hard to draw this so that they're not overlapped, right? The sampled version will still overlap. You have to really separate them out further, right, to avoid that overlap. So those are the real the, the two conditions that are needed to satisfy the sampling theorem. You need to have a function that's what's called band limited in the Fourier domain, and then you need to make sure you're sampling it such that its copies that you're generating are shifted past that band limit. Right? If you can uh, make sure that happens, you're good. So we have this new picture. That's what happened because when our radiation hit our hit our sensor, but we don't want that. We want this. Right? This is our original signal just in the period of it. We want to recover this. And so to recover this, what we can do is apply a, a mask, a digital mask. It'll look like this. So we can multiply our sampled signal that we've now discretized. It's in the computer. Uh, we have a bunch of values, so to speak, in conceptually speaking. We can make sure it's masked out. Okay? And to mask it out, you can just set all of these, multiply all of these other cones around the cone of interest by zero. So that's masking is really the kind of root of the sampling theorem, right? So it's okay, you have a continuous function, you've, you've sampled it. Now make sure you mask out the spurious copies that you've created through that process. Well, what does that mean mathematically? It means you multiply it by this rect function. So you can define a rect function whose bandwidth, whose width, the size of the rectangle, is big enough to capture your signal, but kind of small enough to mask out all the other copies. Okay, so let's go through the onsets that we went ahead and applied that to create our original signal, right? So we have our sample signal, we masked out the copies, we recover our original signal, right? We're good. So let's take that equation and crank the wheel. So that's the same equation I just wrote up. Mask, sampled function, original, continuous function that we want. 
Let's Fourier transform each of those sides. So when you Fourier transform the sample function, you get back this comb, right, the original comb applied to our field. When we Fourier transform the rect, we get this sink function. Remember that from last class? And you have to convolve them, right? They're multiplied together, the rect, the sample version. And so when we Fourier transform each, we then have to convolve each with this Fourier transform. And so you end up with H convolved with our function that's been sampled equals our function. This comb you can just write out as a sampled version of your original signal, right, at each pixel. This sampling is much finer in the spatial domain. It's those little arrows that I drew at the first slide. And so if we plug this expression in here and crank the wheel, you get this final expression at the bottom that says the continuous function of interest that you want, which has an infinite number of values, right, an infinite valued function, is equal to a sample function of finite numbers, right? This is just something you would sample uh, and save in your computer, convolved with a sink. Right? And so what that means is that you can take any sampled version of a function, as long as it's band limited, you then convolve it, you blur it out with the sink function, and you recover exactly the original infinite valued function. Um, and really that sink, why a sink and why convolve it out? Well, it's about this masking. Right. You, you need to mask out the spurious copies that you're introducing by doing any sampling in the first place. If you don't mask it out, then it, you're going to have all these problems. Okay, and so that really forms this bridge that we need in this class between continuous things that are going to happen in the real world, right? radiation going through the patient when the ultrasound is formed, right? the sound waves, or light you know, propagating from the projector to here, and you're taking a picture of it or whatever. And then the digital world on the right, we're then gonna have something that detects that radiation and has a discrete number of values, right? The arrays of numbers you're gonna be manipulating on your homework. And what I'm saying is they're, they're the same. They're exactly the same under certain conditions. I Meaning you can take that finite number of you know, values in your array in Python and perfectly recreate what would have happened in the real world, radiation-wise, under certain conditions, right? These two conditions, I mean. And what are the two conditions? So let's just quickly get try to get clear about that. So we need to sample our images accordingly. The sampling we apply, right, the pixel sizes we use, we ideally want them to satisfy certain conditions. And those conditions are called, generally, if you can hit it just right, it's called Nyquist sampling. And so the exercise I just went through where everything kind of perfectly worked, where the, the, in the Fourier domain, all of those features, those cones rather, separated just so, and then we put the mask just so. That would be this perfect condition of Nyquist sampling. And so what I'm writing here are the bandwidth of the signal and the sampling rate. And so the bandwidth of the signal, who knows, hopefully you've heard this term bandwidth before, that is the width of the cone, right? That cone in the Fourier space. How wide does it go before it turns to zero? You've probably heard bandwidth before applied to like audio, right? It's the same thing. The bandwidth of the system is whatever, 20 kilohertz. It can pass that many frequencies through and then it doesn't pass higher frequencies. Or the bandwidth of our ears, right? Is like up to 25 or 30 kilohertz or whatever. I don't know. It depends on your age and everything. I'm old, so I'm like, I'm like 20. And some of you are 30. My kids are like 40. They can hear really high pitched things, actually. It's weird. So the bandwidth is the width of the cone. So depending on the width of the cone, that's kind of something you need to know, right? Which isn't always easy. So the, the, that width of the cone is how, you know, rapidly fluctuating is your continuous radiation field. And or it depends on that. And sometimes you don't have control over that. Sometimes you do, right? And so you, you kind of need to know that to really make sure the sampling theorem is applied correctly. And so as an engineer, you should always do your best to know the bandwidth of the signals you're dealing with before you, you digitize them, okay? So let's say we know that. We know the width of the cone that's going to come in on average, let's say, or the maximum it's going to be. And then we can design our system to accommodate the maximum bandwidth signal that we might encounter so we make sure we're sampling everything correctly. Then we can define our sampling rate as one over two times that bandwidth. That's Nyquist sampling. If we do that, we're, we're good. It's right on the edge. It's a little risky, but you can do that. Okay, and so that is graphically depicted below, where here I have some signal. And here I'm just drawing a simple sinusoid, right? And that's the maximum you know, frequency you might encounter, for example, let's say across space. 
the finest stripe you might see on the wall in an imaging system. And we're going to make sure we have multiple pixels. Each of our pixels is a blue arrow. Multiple pixels are going to sample that those stripes. That we're sampling at a higher than the Nyquist rate, higher than the Nyquist sampling rate. And so we're, we're fine, right? In other words, our pixel spacing, big X, is less than one over two times the bandwidth. The sampling rate is small. Big X is small, okay? And so if we have a camera and the pixels are really close together and the stripes on the wall are not so fine, we're fine, right? Or you can think about it in terms of audio. Some audio signals coming in, it's high frequency, but if we're sampling it at least a few times per oscillation, we're fine, okay? So here's a case right at the Nyquist sampling. We have our sinusoid and we're just sampling it twice per oscillation, right? That means our, the width of our sampling is equal to one over two times the bandwidth. And so what that means is if I deleted that curve, if I removed it from the screen and said, hey, what frequency was that? You would be able to tell me, probably. You could like kind of draw the dots. I told you it's a sinusoid, right? It's not some triangle function. It's gonna be a sinusoid. Fill in the sinusoid, right? You guys could probably do that, right? You would just kind of try to connect the dots and make a sinusoid. So you're fine there, but you're right on the edge because that's really hard. If I did that in this case, if I deleted the black sinusoidal curve and said, hey, draw the sinusoid that fits this, you'd be totally fine, right? You would just kind of follow the Here, you're right on the edge, but you could do it. Here's where you're in trouble, right? Here, the sampling rate is not fine enough. It's bigger than one over two times the bandwidth. My, my, my blue arrows representing my pixels are really far apart, relatively speaking. And so if I took away this black sinusoid and said, hey, draw the sinusoid, you couldn't because they're constant, right? So there is no sinusoid that would allow you to do that, right? Or like if even it was offset a little, there'd be some ambiguity. You'd be like, well, I could draw this sinusoid or that sinusoid, right? There's a multiple answers to my question. Okay, so that's what the sampling theorem means. It implies that to unlock this ability to recover a complex function, right? Some real world radiation pattern. After sampling it, we need to make sure we're hitting this condition. Okay, and so um, there's a picture of this in the Fourier domain that you're, I think, going to see on your homework. So I'll kind of quickly go through it. So this whole, those three conditions I just showed, each have their own picture in the Fourier domain, right? The first one of having the sampling be uh, really good means, you know, having many pixels across that sign means you're able to take these two tile cones and separate them, right? You're, because the rate at which you're sampling, your pixel spacing, when you take a Fourier transform, defines how much you're shifting those cones around. And so if you sample fine enough, you'll shift the cones further and they won't overlap at all. If you're just at the Nyquist sampling rate, you'll shift the cones apart and they'll just touch. So then you're fine still. You can apply your mask and recover the original signal. Where you get in trouble is where you don't have fine enough sampling. Your sampling is really spaced apart in the spatial domain. In the Fourier domain, that means the cones aren't shifting apart enough and they'll overlap. And so this overlap here, see it all the time, like you hear it all the time, actually it's called aliasing is the term. Aliasing means that certain frequencies are, when they're sampled, then mixed down into lower frequencies. And so you see this visually in pictures. You take a picture, or if you're on Zoom and you're wearing a striped shirt, finely striped shirt, you'll see these weird patterns forming, like weird stripe patterns forming. That's because the stripes on your shirt are being sampled by the pixels in a way that's not satisfying the sampling theorem. And those high frequency stripes are mixing down into lower frequency. You also see this in videos. It's not just effect on space, but also on time, where let's say a car wheel is spinning fast or an airplane propeller is spinning and it like disappears because it starts spinning and spinning and then you can't see it, but then it comes back and it looks like it's sometimes even going backwards. That's aliasing. It's the exact same effect. The really fast movement is aliasing down into lower temporal frequencies. And then you're seeing that. And then it's not real, right? It's, a, it's an artifact. And it's introduced by the sampling process. So we'll write, we're going to be dealing with matrices and vectors. And so the rest of this class, I'm just going to kind of reorient everyone about matrices and vectors because the rest of the class, I'm going to show a lot of matrix and vector equations. 
because we're going to utilize those to understand how optimization and machine learning work. And I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So uh, when I write a vector, I just write it as a lowercase letter. A or okay. So when you see a lowercase letter, that means it's a column vector. So if I want to write a row vector, I write a transpose, right? I need to write a transpose symbol. symbol so that flips it so it's a row vector. Um, if I write a matrix, if I want to express the idea of a matrix, I'll write a capital letter, big A. And if I want to denote this as belonging within a certain domain, there's an, a notational format for that. So if A is a real valued matrix, I will write A is in the value of real numbers. And I can even denote the, the dimensionality it's in. It's in the space of two by two matrices, right? So that R means real. If it's a complex valued matrix, and it's useful to distinguish the two a lot because then you have to change your TensorFlow code, or are you used to? Actually, the newer, anyways, they're getting pretty good, so you don't have to worry so much. But sometimes you, you have to make sure. Uh, it's a complex value, so it's that C algebra, you know, with a line here. I don't know. And the size, again, is two by two. Okay, so we'll see that. And then we're going to have some basic operations. So, so you can take the conjugate of a matrix or a vector. You can take its transpose and its conjugate transpose. None of that is too new or scary to you, right? Um, so conjugate means it's the complex value. You conjugate each complex value. That, you know, I write as conjugate. I just literally write out conjugate because otherwise... People get confused. If it's the transpose, we just did the transpose, it's the little t. And if it's conjugate transpose, that means that we write a star. Okay. So the t becomes a star if it's complex value. So there's inner products and outer products, right? It's the product of a row vector and a column vector. This is the inner product, right? It's the product of a vector that's a column vector and a vector that's a row vector, right? And it equals a scalar value, right? So when you multiply these two, uh, this column vector and row vector, you're going to multiply four times one, and then add five times two, and then add six times three. And that's what? 28, 32, right? So it ends up as a scalar value. That's an inner product. So an outer product is the flip of that. So you multiply a, a row vector on this side with a column vector on this side. The result of an outer product is a matrix, right? And so in that case, it would be a three by three matrix. A Hadamard product, which we'll also do, I'll erase this conjugate stuff. So the Hadamard product is written like this with a circle and a dot, and that's an element wise product, right? And so that would be, for example, you would write it. It's like the kind of naive way of multiplying two vectors. Like if you were, if you didn't know anything about linear algebra and said, hey, multiply these two vectors, you would do a Hadamard product. And that's where you really just multiply each element with itself. Two times five is 10 and three times six is eight. So it's an element-wise product. Okay, and then we have vector addition. That's also trivial, right? You just add each element of the vector up. Matrix vector products are, I'll go through in a second, and then convolutions, which I'll go through. Okay, so here's a picture of a matrix vector product. We're going to be doing a number of these. These matrix generally form our transformations, and the vectors are our images, right? And so the matrix vector product takes an image in one domain or of one type and applies a linear operation to it, linear, tra linear transformation to it. So there's two ways to graphically go through the process of, of completing that matrix vector operation. The first is row by row of the matrix. And so let's say I had a vector U on the right and a matrix T, and I want to compute their product. So I would take U and flip it. So it's a transpose. So it's a row vector. I would perform an inner product, right? I would multiply 10 by 1. 11 by 2 and 12 by 3. That would give me the first entry of my L. And so the first, rather, the first value of your transformed image is going to equal the inner product of the first row of the transformation and your image, right? And then you repeat that process for the second row. So I would take 4, 5, 6, which is the second row of T, and perform that inner product. Again, with the same input vector, and then the third row, okay? So yeah, again, another way to say that is 
you could think of a transform matrix applied to images as a, a series of inner products for each, each uh, resulting value in the image you generate is, is, is informed by the, each row of that transform matrix. The second way to think about it is by doing the matrix vector product as a sum of columns, a weighted sum of columns, right? And so you can perform the same operation by saying, hey, I'm going to consider the first value of my vector u as a weight 10. I'm going to multiply that first weighted uh, 10 to the first column of my transform matrix. And then the 11 gets multiplied by the second column and the 12 gets multiplied by the third column and you add up all those. So there's kind of two ways to picture these transform matrix. The second way again is column by column. So each column is just going to be weighted by the input pixel in that appropriate location uh, for the input image. So sometimes one picture is more useful than the other, I would say. So when you're doing, when this T matrix, capital T is a convolution matrix, as we'll get to, the first, first interpretation makes a bit more sense. But uh, yeah, when you're doing like more abstract transforms, sometimes this picture makes sense. Okay, and so discrete math is the same for most operations we're going to be talking about in this class. So the convolution we talked about previously a few times, it directly ports over to discrete values, which we've already kind of gone through when I was drawing arrows and showing how the values propagate. Right. And so the continuous convolution and the discrete convolution have this like, very close connection. And we're going to go through the convolution one more time. This is the third time we're going to do it. And I'm going to do it a third way to make sure we're all happy and on the same page. I think this is the last time I'm going to do a convolution. And so after this, I hope everyone at least feels a little bit comfortable with them. And of course, you'll be doing them mostly in the computer. So it's not a big deal, but I at least want you to have these. Uh, you'll think back and say, I remember doing this for five minutes. It was so boring but at least you know that you can do it by hand, right? Okay, and so in this exercise, I won't go through these steps, you know, verbally, because I'm just going to do them. I took this again from an online resource, which I linked to on the bottom. But we, here we're going to do a convolution by hand. And this shift and add process, you can make a little table as shown here. So we have a, a two vectors up top that we want to convolve. X is 312. And H, our blur kernel, is 3, 2, 1. I don't know why they chose such similar numbers in this example, but that's just what was available online. So I, you know, I didn't have time to replace them. But we have uh, indexing, right? We want to, again, kind of shift our vectors across from one another and look at their quote unquote area of overlap from our last picture, right? The area of overlap is, is the inner product of those two vectors at that particular shift location, which is the summation of their products. So we have index values k, and you can see in this little table, they start off all the way on the left-hand side. In other words, k starts at a negative value. So they're going to start the vectors off completely off from one another, um, or just overlapping by one entry. Level. And then they're going to shift them all the way through. Why do they do that? Because it's their notation, right? And so I guess I'm picking this, or I like this example, because it shows Yet another weird boundary edge case where you have to define the convolution at the edge in your own way. And so I'll get to this in a second, but just keep that in mind. So first step, we start with our blur matrix. We split it right because of that negative sign issue I mentioned before. So the three, two, one becomes one, two, three. And you can just write it in this first entry. One, two, three. And these two values don't overlap at all with X, but the threes overlap. And so you're going to multiply three by three, and your output is going to be that product, right? Nine. So the, the, the result of this convolution is a vector y. Then you're going to shift the blur kernel one value, one pixel, and repeat that process. So now the one, two, three, I just shifted it. It's like a shift little register, moved over one. And now the two and the three overlap, the x and h, two and three, we're going to multiply. And then the one and three, we're going to multiply. We're going to add those up. So two times three, sorry, rather three times two plus one times three is six plus three is nine, right? So I got another nine. And then we shift it once more. And this is their maximally overlapping in this short vector case, right? All three numbers are paired up with one another. And so we're going to multiply three times one. And then we're going to add one times two. And then we're going to add two times three. And that equals 11. And then we're going to shift it once more. We got one times one plus two times two. And the three now is not hitting anything. So we don't have any value there. It's a zero. We get five. 
And so our final vector y is 9, 9, 11, 5, 2, 0. All right, we did it. So that's the last time we're going to do it. You're going to have to do it once on the homework. Um, sorry, but it's a good exercise. OK, and so this edge case is annoying. And we're going to talk about it in just a second. But just know that 1D convolution process, we just did, it's the same in 2D. You take your array in 2D and shift it, add up all the numbers, shift it, multiply and add up all the numbers, rather, shift it. So it's a 2D inner product. And that's what GPUs are now doing a trillion times a second across the world for the most part, that process. OK, and so there's different ways of treating these 2D convolutions at the boundary of your images. And so I want to just, you should use this slide as a reference or these slides as references, because it really depends where you're doing your convolutions, because different software uses different notation, different edge case notation, notation, OK? And so here's, again, a picture of that 2D convolution process here, this blur kernel 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4 is centered just at the top left of this matrix, but not off to the side, right, for example. And it's going to produce a value here, right? The value that this uh, inner product generates is going to be centered on like, the output of this, this, where this blur kernel is centered. And so you don't have any values here, 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 here. For example, to create values at these edges, you'll need to shift this H up to the left a little bit, but then these values are not overlap with the edge. So you kind of need to think about that. Well, what do we do? Okay, so what does MATLAB do? So MATLAB shifts the blur filter off the image, right? And so the definition of the convolution in MATLAB is in this box um, without really dwelling on it. Sorry, and this isn't just MATLAB. This is also in NumPy. So the same definition is used in NumPy. If you just make a matrix, like a five by five matrix in Python code, and then make a three by three convolution filter and apply the convolution, it's going to start it all the way off in the upper left and just have one value over it, just in that table exercise I showed. And so your first matrix is five by five, your blur matrix is three by three, your output matrix is going to be eight by eight. It's going to make it bigger. It's going to you know, spread out your output, right? And that's because it's starting off in the upper left where they're not overlapping always and ending up in the lower right and there's not overlapping. Right? So that's kind of a funny scenario because then you're adding lots of zeros in. So naturally, if you look at the result of that convolution, if it's an image, things will get darker. Why does that happen? Well, it's just how they define their convolution. And most mathematics books use that definition. So it's kind of the natural definition. What happens in TensorFlow? TensorFlow does not do that because it doesn't obey math, I guess. No, it just makes your life easier. And so what TensorFlow does is it starts the blur kernel just perfectly overlapping in the upper left and then ends it overlapping in the lower right. And so if I have a three by three blur kernel. Here it's like this orange thing that's sliding. It's kind of hard to see, but the little red shows it's a one zero one zero one zero one zero one. The little reds are the numbers. And then it's going to start just in the upper left and slide until it doesn't go off to the side. And so that's three by three. My image is five by five. The output of a convolution in TensorFlow is going to be smaller, right? Because we're shifting the box inside. So you can't recreate the whole five by five thing again, you're left with a three by three result. It turns out this is just easier to work with in machine learning. It's better this way. It's not like, oh, they just did it wrong. So, so that's fine, but just be very aware that you're gonna be doing convolution sometimes in Python, sometimes in TensorFlow, and then things will look different. And you might be like, well, what's going on? This is what's going on. These, these concepts are really important. Uh, you should hopefully like kind of feel at some point comfortable with these mathematical definitions or terms and what they mean practically. So symmetric matrices, hopefully that's not too scary to anyone. It's just a matrix that's symmetric along the diagonal. And so those have really nice properties, right? We, we like to use those. Um, they're easily invertible, generally if they're Hermitian symmetric. And you know they're equal to their transpose or their conjugate transpose, depending on the values in the matrix. Okay, and so then I use these terms 
square hot dog and hamburger matrices a lot. So a square matrix is that like three by three matrix that I showed, right? It's square. So a, a hot dog matrix is not surprisingly long and thin, right? So that's like three rows by 10 columns. And then a hamburger matrix C is going to be tall for me. As you'll see, we're going to be dealing with matrices in our discussions of optimization. When you want to, you have an equation, and you have a matrix, and you want to invert it, you want to get rid of it, this is the best place to be. Square matrices are great for that. You can compute their inverse. When you have a long, fat hot dog matrix, this is not a good place to be. It's the worst place to be. Right, because you're taking a vector when you do a matrix vector product, you're taking a very long vector with lots of numbers and getting a very short vector with very few values. So you're losing information. So when you want to go backwards and get back all of those long values by inverting it, you're in trouble. You have like three numbers, you want to get 10 numbers. Well, that's hard, right, to do generally. So this is, a, and then this is the third case where you have a hamburger matrix. This is actually fine generally. It's not great, it's not as good as this, but you're okay generally here. You can do what's called a pseudo inverse to work with these matrices. Okay. And so we'll discuss that, but I just want you to have like kind of a picture, a graphical picture of what those mean. And then, yeah, these last few terms, diagonal matrix, toplitz matrix, banded matrix, we'll be using those in the course. So hopefully those aren't too scary as well, but I'll define them when I need them. Okay, so the convolution theorem I had written out before at the beginning of this class, again, as review, it's, you see those integrals, it's a continuous defined with continuous functions. There's an analogy, there's the same thing with discrete functions, right? So all of that stuff I was saying, well, you just take the Fourier transform and, and then multiply the two things. The exact same thing holds, thanks to the sampling theorem, with discrete matrices. And so what that means is everything I just said, you can actually just do in your code, right? You have a vector, you want to convolve it with another discrete vector. You can take the Fourier transforms, the discrete Fourier transform of each of those and, and convolve them. So a discrete Fourier transform is, so I also wrote a Fourier transform before, it's with an integral for continuous functions. There's a direct analogy with discrete vectors. And a, a discrete Fourier transform is a transformation, just like the regular Fourier transform, but literally it's just a matrix. Yeah. So the Fourier transform really to me is just this matrix. You just multiply your signal, which is a vector into a matrix, the particular matrix, lots of great properties. It's circular, it is complex value naturally, uh, but it's, it's pretty useful and you, you get your output, right? And so what these slides go through, which maybe I'll bring up later, is there's two different ways to define, or there's ways to prepare your signal to apply discrete Fourier transforms. Sometimes you need to shift your signal with this np.fsd shift function. So just keep that in the back of your mind. These are not some abstract representation of radiation or anything. These are just arrays of numbers that define an image that you can download and you can convolve it with another array of numbers and you can get some blurred output image. Right? All of you, we're gonna do that in the labs. And so you're gonna get comfortable with that. You can do all of that also by just, before doing that, applying a discrete Fourier transform, which is np.fft. You can then multiply with a filter, filtered version where you low pass filtered your image, right? you've removed the high spatial frequencies, and then you np.ifft2 back, you inverse Fourier transform back, and then you get your blurred image on the upper one. Okay? So all of that is, is just um, hopefully well-defined mathematically. When we're in the discrete world, Fourier transforms are just matrix vector products. Right? Our signal of interest is a vector. We transform it with the 2D matrix and we get an output, a vector. Right? So the same is true with convolutions, not surprising. So we have our vector. We want to perform a convolution. We can represent that. It's a linear transform. Right? It's a bunch of multiplies and adds that we had to do with a shift register. Um, you can naturally summarize all of that in a matrix vector product. And so here is one way, again, there's multiple ways to define it, so just be a little bit careful, but one way to define a convolution. So the input vector is U. This can represent an image, for example, you've unwrapped. And then we want to blur it out. And so we're going to multiply it with a convolution matrix. And so remember, one interpretation of this is 
you take the inner product of the vector with the first row of the matrix to get the first value of y, the output. And so we can multiply the like, first value of u with the first value of the blur to get an output. And then for the next two values, the second value in the output is the shifted version. You shift the blur filter over one, repeat that process, shift the blur filter over two, repeat that process. And so on. So you can just write that out in a big matrix. And so abstractly, you can write any convolution just as a matrix, right, product, which we'll all do on the homework. So y equals a big A times B. Right? That's a convolution, if A is a convolution. OK, and so the last thing, I'm not going to dwell on this. We will return to it later, is something else we're going to do multiple times in this class are matrix and vector derivatives. And this is. It's really silly, but important to do to summarize how neural networks and machine learning operations work. There's nine cases of matrix vector derivatives. That's why it's so annoying. And each one's a little bit different. And so it's very confusing. And so why are there nine? Well, you can have a scalar, a vector, or a matrix. And you can take the derivative of that with respect to a scalar, a vector, or a matrix. So that forms this three by three table of options. And each one is kind of like unique. And when you're quickly reading something or just looking, it's not always clear which is the case because uh, maybe it's a symbol isn't as bold as it should be when the book was printed or whatever. And so there's just simpler, there's a set of simple kind of tools that you can kind of get, you can get comfortable with um, or an intuition about these. So I'm going to go through one example of how you can kind of figure it out. And so what I generally do is let's say I have a, an equation. And they say, hey, here's this vector u. That's the output image. I want to understand the derivative of that with respect to the input image, v. Right? And so I'm presented with this equation. I generally break it down into a scalar equation. right? So you can pick an output, u3, the third entry of the output image, the third pixel, and say, what, how, what is that? And so you can write that out. In this simple case, it's the inner product right, of the third row of w and v, right? So it's the third row of w, first column times v1. So then I say, well, what's the derivative, the scalar derivative, just thinking of regular derivatives, regular numbers, the scalar derivative of that third pixel of the output with respect to, let's say, the second pixel of the input. Just pick a random number, it doesn't matter, but just index it here, the third with respect to the second. And so you can take that derivative, and in this simple equation, it becomes really simple. The derivative is just equal to the third row, second column of them, right? But you can imagine having a more complicated equation with a matrix, with a nonlinearity, or additions of other terms, right? Similarly, arriving at a relatively simple expression here. And then you just kind of abstract that away. You say, well, instead of 3, 2, let's just replace that with some ij, right? Any indices that will propagate to, right? And so now I have. Uh, an equation where I know, well, the derivative of the i value of u with respect to the j value of v equals the entry wij. So then I can generalize it out to a matrix or vector term. So then I know the derivative of u as a vector with respect to v as vector is actually the matrix w. And if j and i were flipped, which sometimes they do flip, then it would be w transpose. When confused, I do that because these do get confusing. I break it all down into a scalar with indices and then build it back up. You can also use dimensionality to help you. So when you take the derivative of something, let's say A with respect to B, the dimensionality of the output has to match the dimensionality of B, right? So if B is a scalar, the derivative of a matrix with respect to a scalar, the output has to be a scalar, single value. If it's a vector, it has to be a vector. Matrix needs to be a matrix. So you can use that to help you out. And then the matrix cookbook is also excellent. So it's a great resource. It's online. Just Google matrix cookbook. That's, again, was like a whirlwind summary of all the math we need to know. Hopefully this, these slides can serve as a reference for when you're doing the homework. Um, next class, we're going to start talking about machine learning. Well, we'll really start with optimization and go through examples of, of optimization in the context of machine learning. Okay.